Hi everyone, I'm Christopher Frugge from Rutgers University, and in this video, I'll be talking about my paper called Normativity from Nothing. So, just to give you an overview of what's going to happen in this video, I want to first present in really big picture terms the problem um, I'm grappling with in this paper and the sort of very broad, big picture solution I'm going to propose. And then after that, I'm going to sort of step back work through some of the background metaphysical details that I need to both build up um, a more detailed and subtle sense of both the problem as well as the solution to it. And then I'm going to end with a sketch of a um, implementation of that solution that revolves around social construction. So what is the actual problem that I want to deal with um, address in this paper. Um, basically, it's a dilemma between naturalism and the is-ought principle. So this is a classic dilemma from the meta-ethics literature. Um, basically, there's a dilemma between um, two plausible principles, one naturalism, one the is-ought principle. Um, they're both, they both seem to be plausible, but they don't seem to be mutually satisfiable. So, what is this dilemma? Well, naturalism says, more or less, that all facts must either be natural, they must be identical to natural facts, or grounded in solely natural facts. So, either every fact is purely natural, or if you allow that there's um, facts that aren't natural, then they've got to be grounded fully in natural facts at some point in the grounding chain. The is odd principle says, basically, you can't jump right from an is to an ought. So another way to put this is that no normative facts can be solely grounded in natural facts. So if you've got a normative fact, it can be maybe partially grounded in natural facts, but you've always got to have a normative fact grounding in nat an another normative fact, or the normative fact has to be um, basic in some sense. It can't be grounded in solely natural facts. So the classic, uh, this is a classic dilemma in the meta-ethics literature because um, both principles seem to be really plausible. We would like ideally to have, or at least many of us, uh, would like ideally to have, to satisfy both principles in our meta-ethical theory, but they don't seem to be mutually consistent. So just to sketch the dilemma for you, take, um, take a normative fact and let's say, um, take a normative fact, so the is odd principle is going to say either it, it's got to be, it can't be grounded at all, or if it's grounded, it's got to be grounded um, with some other normative fact. But naturalism says, look, for all facts, including this very normative fact, it either has to be natural. We're going to assume it's not natural right now because we're going to hold that it's normative. It's got to be, it's either got to be natural, which it's, in this case, it's a normative fact, so it's not, or it's got to be grounded in solely natural facts. But the is our principle is going to say, no, this normative fact can be grounded in solely natural facts. So there seems to be a straightforward um, contradiction between these two principles. Yet, ideally, we'd like to have both, right? So in this um, talk, I want to sketch um, my proposed solution, uh, my proposed way to actually satisfy the dilemma, or sorry, to navigate the dilemma and satisfy both principles. And the big picture idea is basically if you allow there to be null grounding, so where this is where there's grounding, but it's grounding from no grounds whatsoever, you've got something that's grounded, but it's not grounded in, so to speak, any other facts. If you allow for that, then you can actually satisfy both naturalism and the is -ought principle. You can have your cake and eat it too. So that's the really big picture overview of the, um, the problem and it's my proposed solution. So now I want to sort of step back and do some background metaphysical work, um, per, sort of give a sense of my conception of how grounding works, and then I'm going to use that to give um, more nuanced interpretations of naturalism and the is -ought principle, and also to get a better sense of what null grounding is. Okay, so to start, 
Um, a key component of my conception of how grounding works is that it always involves what I call metaphysical connections. So this is not something particularly unique to me. More and more these days, people who are into grounding think that um, it, it either always or often goes via what, are, what, um, what I'm calling here connections, which is basically just something that is going to link between the grounds of the grounded fact and the grounded fact itself. Something that's saying, hey, these, these things ground at that thing in really metaphorical um, terms. So the best way to get your head around this is via some examples. So I've got, I guess, five here. And the first is just a classic example from Kit Fine. So this is um, the claim that the singleton set of Socrates is grounded in Socrates' ground. So that's sort of the, uh, just a very standard grounding example. But um, I add that the connection is the set builder operation. So Kit Fine doesn't put it in exactly these terms. Um, he doesn't claim that there's something like a connection operating here, though he does appeal at various points in um, glossing this grounding relation between the singleton set of Socrates and Socrates that it's explained or backed or goes via or something to that effect, the set builder operation, which is a thing that forms sets out of um, entities. Um, another example, again, due to, sort of, sort of due to Kit Fine is um, the example that the empty set is null grounded from no grounds whatsoever. And I'm going to gloss this as the connection here is again the set builder operation. So Kit Fine famously introduces the idea of null grounding via the, uh, by way of the empty set example. So it seems like the empty set is generated. Um, it's not sort of an er element of reality, um, yet it has no members and we tend to think um, the grounds of a set are its members. So it seems like the empty set is a, a nice example of what um, I'm calling null grounding here. And he doesn't, again, he doesn't talk in these connection-y, linky terms, but he sort of appeals to, in glossing why this null grounding happens at all, he appeals to the set builder operation as something that takes, in this case, takes in nothing but outputs the set of nothing, which is just the empty set. But we can treat the, the set builder operation as a connection. It's a link between, in this case, in the first case, Socrates and the singleton set of Socrates, and in this case, between nothing and the empty set of it. Um, some more, turning to some more down to earth examples. Um, so we might think that the shape clay if, um, is the ground of the statue and but the intention of the artist or sculptor to make the statue is the connection between the shape clay and the statue so it's the thing that's uh, that links the shaped clayness to the statueness um, you need the intention there saying hey uh, this shaped clay is a thing that gives rise to this statue another example is the building being six stories tall is the ground for the building being illegal but this isn't going to go through unless you've got something like a connection, which is uh, a political law to the effect that in this jurisdiction, um, it's illegal for buildings to be more than five stories tall. A final example, um, I should say this example is kind of, I'm reworking this from Gideon Rosen. Um, turning next now to the final example, somewhat due to John Searle, um, we, we could say that the shell is, ground, is the ground for the dollar, but you need a connection linking the shell to the monetary dollarness, um, and that's something to the effect of the society has collectively agreed that shells um, count as money or count as dollars. Um, so these are some examples of um, when I'm thinking of grounds grounded and then the metaphysical connections linking the grounds to the grounded, just to get your head around this. Um, and two crucial claims to draw from these examples is that connections can themselves be grounded. So some metaphysicians in this area who like connection-y sort of things, they um, like um, Jonathan Schaffer and Tobias Wilsch, they're thinking of these connections as actually something akin to fundamental ungrounded connections like metaphysical laws. 
But I'm allowing a more um, liberal notion of connections where perhaps there are metaphysical laws, perhaps there are ungrounded connections, but I, crucially, I want to allow for some of the connections to themselves be grounded. Just like in, intentions in the statue case, collective agreements in the shells or money case, and um, uh, political laws in the illegality of the building being a certain height case. This is going to be crucial later in the toy example of the solution where I appeal to a social construction-y kind of picture of morality. So that's the first main claim to draw um, from these examples. The second one is that crucially there can be null grounding. So we see already here that uh, from the kit fine sort of example that the empty set is null grounded from no grounds whatsoever. There's no members of the empty set, but still I claim that there's a connection here, which is the set builder operation. So it's not, so you have null grounding, um, but it's, it's not the case that there's like grounding from uh, ex nihilo, grounding from and in nothing or via nothing whatsoever, but it's rather you've got grounding from no grounds, but you still have connections. So this is crucial for the purposes of this paper in that appealing to metaphysical connections um, allows us to uphold null grounding, but um, not treat it in a completely wacky or mysterious way. You've still got something going on, the connections, uh, and the connections are crucial in what allows for there to be grounding from no grounds whatsoever. So, oh, excuse me. So, um, so that was sort of background conception of how, I, how I'm thinking about grounding and why we should allow for null grounding in a, in a way that makes it not entirely wacky or crazy. Now I'm going to turn to um, giving some interpretations of naturalism and the is ought principle using this framework of grounds connection grounded. So to start with naturalism, um, we can actually, given metaphysical connections, we can see that there's um, at least two interpretations of naturalism. One um, I've called strong and the other I've called weak. So the first interpretation of naturalism is that every metaphysical grounding, um, every chain of metaphysical grounding eventually features solely natural grounds and connections. So basically for every fact, um, if it's grounded, then um, then it's got it's got to be the case that for that grounded fact at some point the grounding chain has includes and has only natural facts as grounds and connections so it's this inclusive notions of notion of at some point you've got to have solely natural grounds and connections so that's why I'm calling the strong version the weak version is a more exclusive notion excluding notion where it's, it's more weakly the claim that every fact is either a natural fact or it has a grounding chain that at some point has no normative or otherwise non-natural facts as either grounds or connections. So the weak um, version of naturalism, um, it's an exclusive notion. Basically it's saying for every, every fact, either it's natural or if it's a grounded fact, then at some point everything that appears is a natural fact, so you can't include um, facts that aren't natural, but it doesn't require that natural facts enter in. Um, and I guess I should say the strong version should have this bit about every fact is either a natural fact. So the strong version of naturalism is also meant to exclude ungrounded facts that aren't themselves natural. If a fact is ungrounded, it's got to be natural. So. It might seem that the strong and weak versions um, are quite similar, but crucially, they're going to tease apart if you allow for null grounding. So null grounding um, is going to be actually ruled out by the strong version of naturalism, but allowed by the weak version of naturalism. So why is that? Well, basically, the strong version says that at some point, you've got to have natural grounds and connections, but null grounding right, is crucially grounding from no grounds whatsoever. So that's going to violate strong naturalism because you're not including natural grounds because you don't have any grounds whatsoever. But the weak version of naturalism is fine with null grounding because it just says if you include grounds and connections at some point in the grounding chain, then they've got to be natural. But it doesn't say you have to always include natural grounds and connections. So null grounding is fine because so long, I should say, as the connections are themselves natural, because then you've only got natural stuff going on. So it's fine by weak, uh, weak naturalism's light. 
So turning now to the is op principle, similarly, there's a strong and a weak version um, of the is op principle. Uh, so the strong version says no normative fact is identical to a natural or otherwise non-normative fact. And for each normative fact, either it's ungrounded or it's grounded such that at each step in the grounding chain, it has at least one uh, normative ground or connection. So um, again, like sort of like strong naturalism, strong the strong version of the is op principle is an inclusive notion. So basically it says, if you've got a normative fact, it can't be identical to a normative fact. And um, either it's just an ungrounded uh, fundamental normative fact, or if it's a grounded normative fact, at each point in the grounding chain, you've got to always have some normative fact feature in as either grounds or connections. So it's an inclusive notion where normative facts have to play a role at every point in the grounding chain. Weak naturalism, by contrast uh, to strong, sorry, weak, the weak is ought principle, by contrast to the strong is ought principle, is an excluding, exclusive sort of notion akin to weak naturalism. So it again says no normative fact is identical to a natural or otherwise non normative fact, but where it differs from the strong is ought principle. It says, basic, uh, I'll just read it and I'll give the gloss. And for each normative fact, either it is ungrounded or at no point in its grounding chain do solely natural or otherwise non-normative facts serve as both grounds and connections. So it's, it's an exclusive sort of notion and basically what it's saying, for a grounded normative fact, um, it can't be that at some point in the grounding chain, you've got both natural grounds and natural connections. So that would be in effect a jump from an is to an ought. Um, again, like akin to uh, naturalism, the, for the is ought principle, the strong and the weak versions, they differ when it comes to null grounding. So, the, so no grounding is ruled out by the strong but not the weak version of the is ought principle um, because again, it's, they differ over whether they're inclusive or exclusive. So strong says you've got to always include for grounded normative facts um, at least one normative ground or connection. The weak one just says you can't at any point have solely um, non-normative grounds and connections. So the crucial bit is no grounding is allowed by the weak version because no grounds whatsoever are neither natural are not natural at all. So it's totally fine with the weak version of the Izzat principle. So notice no grounding, fine by the weak version of naturalism, fine by the weak version of the Izzat principle. And I can go into more detail into this in the Q&A later on discussion, but my claim is that the weak versions of naturalism and the Izzat principle capture the core, um, the the sensible core constraints of our more uh, rough and ready um, notions of naturalism in the Izzat principle. So for weak naturalism, it's a, it's a sensible sense of naturalism because it basically says at some point you've got to get rid of everything that's not natural. And similarly for weak, the weak Izzat principle, it's a very sensible um, notion of the Izzat principle because in saying you can't at some point have just solely natural grounds and connections, it's still banning a jump from an is to ought. So let's turn now to how to navigate the dilemma. It's probably obvious by now, but I say, hey, null grounding can do it. And so how exactly can null grounding help us navigate the dilemma? Well, the claim is if you allow that the most basic normative facts are null grounded from no grounds but via natural connections, then you can simultaneously satisfy the weak version of naturalism and the weak version of the Izzat principle. So you can navigate the dilemma uh, and have your cake and eat it too. Why, why does it satisfy both? Well, it satisfies weak naturalism because um, there are no ungrounded normative facts. So we can allow that every normative fact is grounded, but um, the most basic normative facts, they're themselves grounded. They're just null grounded via no ground, from no grounds, but via natural connections. And this is fine with weak naturalism because we're allow the only thing that's playing a role are these connections, but those are solely natural. So totally satisfies weak naturalism. How does it satisfy the is ought principle, the weak is ought principle? 
because again, we're holding that even though all normative facts are grounded, um, at each step in the grounding chain, there you're going to include uh, normative facts um, until you get to the most basic normative facts, which are themselves null grounded. But notice they're not they're null grounded, so they don't have any natural grounds whatsoever. So even though they have natural connections, they have no natural grounds. And the weak is odd principle says just that you can't have both natural grounds and connections for uh, normative facts. But in this case, you don't because you have no grounds whatsoever, even though you have natural connections. So null grounding of the most basic normative facts satisfies both weak naturalism and the weak versions of the Izzat principle. So you can satisfy both of these constraints. So that all of this so far has been very high level and schematic. Um, I want to turn now to talking through um, a toy view of how to implement null grounding um, in a way that satisfies both uh, weak naturalism and the weak versions of the Izzat principle. And I'm going to sort of um, to do this. I'm going to sketch um, very briefly uh, a social constructionist picture of normativity. So I'm myself already inclined to broadly social constructionist approach to normativity, and I think um, it's, an, it's a very nice um, and plausible way to implement this overall null grounding approach um, to metaethics. So really briefly, what, how can we um, come up with a toy social constructionist view? We'll take the property of being a reason to be a mo the most basic normative property. Many meta-ethicists meta are inclined to this and hold as is quite plausible that we can jointly intend that there be reasons for something or other, which is a very natural way to think about joint intentionality and collective agreements um, of socially constructed, um, of many socially constructed phenomena. So for example, just to take a really um, simple example, just say that two parents um, jointly intend that there's a reason for them to take turns changing a diaper. This seems like something that happens all the time, um, and we can build up more complex examples um, um, after this. So, take allow if you allow that there can be joint intentions, that there be reasons for something or other, then you can claim. Then it's it's very plausible to claim that uh, the joint this joint intention that there be reason for something or other serves as a connection in the null. Uh, sorry, no grounding, it should say, of being a reason. So you just take the joint intention that there be a reason or something, the reason for something or other to serve as a connection in the normative fact of there being uh, this property of being a reason. Um, why might you think this? Well, just think about that the joint intention conceives of being a reason as a sui generis normative property and so the joint intention determines the nature of this property such that it's generated from nothing whatsoever because it's this radically new kind of sui generis normative property. Um, and in doing this, in determining the nature of this normative property, the joint intention itself serves as connection. But notice, a joint intention is a totally natural thing. It's a solely natural thing. So we've got uh, a normative property of being a reason as um, as null grounded with a natural joint intention as connection. And here to end, I've just got a, a schematic picture of the kind of view I'm proposing. This dash mark indicates no, no grounds whatsoever. So you've got a joint intention that certain natural facts make um, certain normative facts. That's going to generate um, uh, null grounded normative property from that intention and then the null grounded normative property can itself serve as connection in the generation of um, the actual its instantiation the instantiation of that normative property from the certain natural facts okay thanks